Hi, and welcome to this newest episode of the 10 Minute Leader. In this episode, we're going to be talking to a leader who leads a large organization, over 8,000 employees around the world. And we're going to be talking about what it looks like to lead in that context. Uh, this is with Paul Subri. He's the uh, CEO, the president of uh, an NFI group, which is New Flyer Industries. They make buses and other uh, transportation equipment uh, for countries around the world. And it's a great conversation hearing from him. He's uh, had a great influence in the world of manufacturing, but even just in the world of leadership, he's well known around uh, across the country and for sure around the world and what this looks like. So tune in and enjoy and uh, let me know what you think. Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The 10 Minute Leader. I'm here today with Paul Subri. Now I'll give a little bit of an introduction to who this guy is. Some of you probably know who he is, but some of you may not. And so the short version is that he is currently the president and chief executive officer of NFI Group Inc. Now that might not mean a whole lot, but maybe if you've heard of New Flyer Industries, that's the uh, company that runs New Flyer Industries. And uh, they're the lar world's largest bus and coach manufacturers. They have over 8,000 team members across 10 different countries. They're basically a leading global bus and motor coach manufacturer providing a ton of different industry expertise in that realm. I'm not a bus guy, but uh, uh, we won't dig into those technical expertise today anyway. And uh, Paul himself is a graduate from the University of Manitoba. He's completed a number of other educational uh, ventures, including some schooling at uh, Harvard Business School. And he's a regular speaker on things like leadership, innovation, technology, business, uh, the transportation industry as well. And of course, uh, involved in a ton of different community activities from what I've been able to see as well. And uh, Lots of awards, Paul. One of them that I highlight, I'll highlight here, named uh, Canada's top CEO of the year by National Post back in 2016. And then before your time at New Flyer, you worked at Standard Arrow, including some time as their president and chief executive officer. So that's a bunch of stuff, Paul. Welcome to the show. Is there anything I missed? Anything you want to add in for no, your no, intro? No, no, very kind of you, Ben. Uh, been a really lucky guy, and uh, a lot of it's uh, having great leaders, you know, helping uh, me develop and learn, and, and being at the right place at the right time. So very kind of you. Oh, it's my pleasure, and thanks for joining me on this uh, on this interview. And and you mentioned you know leadership, having great leaders, and that's really what the ten minute leader is all about: trying to engage with other leaders, hearing some of the things that they've learned in their lives, and then sharing that with the people that tune into this. So uh, I, I did send you those uh, five questions ahead of time, and we'll work our way through those. But hey, we can bounce around on whatever comes to mind for you. And then, like uh, I've said with all my interviews that I've done, a little bit of a surprise question at the end of this interview kind of have a little bit of fun that, that uh, you haven't been given any heads up about. So hopefully you're not too nervous about that one. Fire away. Sounds good. Okay. Well, let's jump right in. So the first question that, that I wanted to ask, when you think of kind of leadership and what are some of the burning issues that are out there that leaders need to address these days? Well, you know, let me answer that. And a couple of the other questions we'll talk about kind of leadership philosophies and learnings. But, you know, this whole COVID pandemic that you know, we all say, but it's so true. None of us could ever have imagined how deep, how wide the impact on our working lives, our customers, our business lives and, and all that other stuff. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of it is actually obvious in hindsight, but, you know, having people work remote, uh, never, never limited opportunity to physically interact and so forth you know, the ability to think that we've communicated or the effectiveness of what we've said or what we've communicated, you know, the, the, the ability to check for understanding or, or that the receivers got, not, not only kind of what we said, but what it means in the context is really hard. And as much as you and I can have this visual conversation compared to, you know, a couple of years ago, we would have done it on a, on a phone call. Um, it's really different. And, and I think my learning, you know, ages, experiences, cultural dynamics, uh, maybe some, some time zone issues, everybody hears and listens differently. Mm. And so that whole concept of making sure that you kind of get acceptance, you know, hey, Ben, you and I are going to use blue pens, not red pens. You got it? You know, like ensuring that there's acceptance, understanding, it's so, so critical, I think, now in this crazy world. And who knows how many people are going to physically go back to work. I think the majority of them personally. But that, that world now of distance working, you know, there was distance learning, there was remote right. workers or commuters, but I, I think that's a big deal. The second yeah. thing is, is the whole social overload. You know, I just think about my life and my career, you know, going to high school, university, I, you know, I check the paper once in a while, very seldom. My dad at dinner told me what was important. Once in a while, I'd watch the news as I started working and so forth. And I got into this 
kind of religious uh, process every day of reading the newspaper. But, but you know, I have kids in their 20s now and their friends and people that work here. And so not only the normal media overload, but the social media overload and the, the pace at which stuff gets dispersed. Unfortunately, some of it's true and unfortunately, some of it's not true. Mm. And so that ability for people to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff and understand, you know, what is, what is meaningful, but what's also relevant to what we work on. And, and helping our people understand that stuff. So h- however we handle meetings, however we disseminate learnings and information to these people, whether it's emails or whether it's you know Teams calls or whatever, that kind of stuff. Right. And then, and the last thing on, on this burning platform, I think, and it's really opened up my eyes in the last couple of years, and we see that it's in our everyday life, whether you're buying a pen off of Amazon or whatever, the days of being able to see my competitor is gone, right? right? The competitor right. is, in many cases, not around the corner, in many cases, invisible, what they, right. you know, how they steal or, or go after my customer, how they influence that customer's choice hmm. and so forth. You, you know, so the, the ability to get unlock, draw a little strategic map and think I got it, that thing's going to change the minute the ink's dry. So, you know, there's a couple of things that I think that, that are sitting in front of a leader today that we got to kind of be very, very aware of. Yeah, and I definitely love that. And, and, you know, communication has always been a big piece of that. But yeah, like you said, the putting it into the technology world and the world of, of Zoom, it, it definitely adds another layer that many of us aren't prepared of before because we, we didn't realize it was going to happen like this, right? So yeah, we gotta pull, pull up our socks. Yeah. Well, and it, you know, you joke about it. Of course, my hair's falling out. But, you know, you and I looking at each other right now, you know, intuitively every once in a while we look at ourselves. And so the minute I think, you know, am I looking reasonable or looking like I'm paying attention? Right. As soon as I do that, I've lost focus on right. what you're saying. Right. And so while I think I've told everybody, hey, I told you we're losing blue pens. Uh, you know, that, yeah. that goes back to that ensuring we got understanding and acceptance and, and, and learning. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And, and you mentioned already a little bit of kind of some of just leadership principles. You, you referred to that a little bit. So for you, when you look at your own leadership, what are some leadership principles that you've integrated into your life and your career that have helped you grow in your success and your ability to influence others? Well, I, you know, people that know me, I'm a bit of a junkie for quotes and whether they're sports analogies or quotes, I just, I think it's a really cool to, to visualize the concept or the whatever. So a couple of things. One of my bosses years ago has told me that leadership is not the same as management. Now, I, I came out of university with a business degree. I thought I knew everything, right? Mm-hmm. And so to me, to be successful for the long term, we, we got to learn that they're different and we got to do both. And, and management meaning manage people and processes and control systems, right? And leadership is so much around vision and inspiration and so forth. And, and as leaders, you kind of got to keep pivoting back and forth. Yes, you got to make sure stuff gets done, but you also got to help people understand you know, kind of where you're going and, and, and inspire people to kind of want to do that. So that's one. Number two, I read a, a business book probably 30 years ago that I still read every once in a while, and I don't read many of them. It was called The Great Game of Business. And it was about a, mm. a little business in the middle of the United States that was part of a big company that was going bankrupt and was being sold. And so they created this little, this little book and this little methodology called The Great Game of Business by a guy named Jack Stack. And I, I just absolutely love this quote because uh, I'm a sports junkie. And he said, you can sometimes fool the fans, but you can never fool the players. Meaning I, then I could walk you through my plant and say, hey, that's clean. That's a cool bus. Right. Boy, that's a neat little computer. And think I nailed it, right? Yeah. But the people know whether they're paid well. They know whether they're trained. They know whether they're safe. They know whether the right. tool I've given them to put it together. My customer knows whether my bus works or doesn't work or whether it's right. fuel is efficient. So, and my, at the end of the day, my bank knows or my shareholder knows whether I have cash or don't have cash, right? right. And so I, I, keep, I keep saying that to our team and using it all the time about hmm. we got to make sure that, that we're, we're not saying something or acting a certain way. And yet the people really know, right? Because if we yeah. lose credibility or humility or sincerity, you, you've lost the room to, to use another stupid sports analogy, right? <laughs> yeah. And then the last one, I think from a principal perspective, and um, you know, it's funny, I, I, I as you know, involved uh, on the board of, of the Winnipeg Jets with, uh, with Mark Chipman and the team and watching that whole dynamic is fantastic. But this, this concept of, you know, the only real source of competitive advantage is people. And so whether it's Mark's hockey team whether it's our team building, designing, integrating autonomous stuff into buses, 
you know, it's the people that are going to make it happen. And there's very few businesses or industries where, you know, where one person can carry the day. And so how do you get the army to follow and how do you get everybody to believe in the, in the vision? And so that focus on our people as the competitive advantage is, is easy to say, hard to do. Right. But I love that reminder, right? Because so many times, and I was actually just talking with uh, with a client of mine this morning around this exact issue where, you know, we know that people are important, but so often our actions speak louder than words, right? And so we need to keep reminding ourselves of that and then actually being intentional with investing in them, helping uh, empower them, train them, equip them, or else it's uh, it, the, the thought doesn't actually translate into action. So I appreciate the well, reminder. The, uh, I, I always try and use this. It's, it's impossible to measure, but I always sit them back in my chair and say, are people following me because they have to, because I got a fancy title or because they want to? And if we could measure that, that's really what we're after is let's right. inspire, let's go somewhere and, and follow as opposed to Subri said, use blue pens. So we're going to use blue pens, right? <laughs> and I, I wish there was a simple test, but that should be the ultimate goal, I think. Right. Well, like they say, most people, when they leave an organization, they're, they're leaving, not leaving the job, they're leaving the manager or the leader that yep. they, they've been working under, right? So yep. definitely applies. Uh, one of the things I like to ask leaders is what are some of the greatest or maybe hardest lessons that they have learned or had to learn as a leader? So when you hear that, what are some of those lessons that you've had to learn? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to my little uh, love of quotes. And there's a couple of things that come to mind. First of all, you're always on stage. So you can kid yourself that people aren't paying attention to the way you dress or why they talk or where you go. And, you know, I'll, I'll take it into the context of our crazy COVID pandemic, right? The minute we could come back to work, I don't care how many were physically here, I was going to be here because if these people are going to be here in what's perceived as harm's way, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And so mm -hmm. I, I need to be on on uh, on stage. And I think it also implies in your person, in your personal life, whether you're out at a restaurant or you're at Safeway, mm -hmm. you're going to inter interact with people that know you or know the people that work for you or so forth. Number two, I, I, I think this is really cool. It's hard to do again, but we need when we're when we're setting vision and or we're setting goals or we're priorities or whatever. The trick to me is getting people not only to know what we're trying to do, but why. And I think if people understand the context of the why, you know, we're using blue pens because blue is the highest contrast on white. And here's why we're going to sure. do it. People will have a way better understanding as opposed to just go use your blue pen. Right. Um, the, another one that I think is fantastic and you, I don't know, you, you're, I'm older than you are, but you remember the movie back uh, in 1980s with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd called Trading Places. Yeah. And yeah. I, I love the movie, not only as a comedy, but this concept of people are a product of their environment. And mm -hmm. so if, if you put a, a bunch of really skilled people or unskilled people, it doesn't matter, in our factory and it's a dump and it's not safe and they don't have the right tools. Mm -hmm. And I say, make a, a world-class bus. It is impossible mm -hmm. to do so. Yeah. So if we want those people to be successful, we got to have the right tools and training and environment and culture and all those kinds of things. Because I fundamentally believe people become a product of their environment. And if we give them the, the right opportunity to excel, uh, excel they will. Um, I played university basketball, not a hell of a lot. I spent most of the time on the bench, but our, <laughs> our coach at the time uh, said something that I ultimately found out was from John Wooden, who was a, a, a famed coach at UCLA that said something like, it's amazing what can be accomplished when nobody cares who gets the credit. Mm. And so it, it's, it really is, is true. You know, we're designing world-class electric vehicles that have autonomous elements and so forth. And while there's a bunch of stars around this business, I can go over to our new product development site and it truly is, they made it, not Freddie made it or Susie made it or whatever, right? And so nobody's jumping right. up and down saying, I designed it. And I think right. that's, you know, listening and watching the Jets dynamic and watching the way Mark and, and Kevin Sheffield, they often manage the team in the business. Right. They're trying to build a team that's going to win. Yeah, you got to have stars. But at the end of the day, if everybody plays without caring who got the goal or who got the assist or who, whatever, that's critical. Um, yeah. And I'll toss out one more, which I, I really like. <laughs> and I kind of made this one up, but I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's appropriate. Everybody has their opinion. So, you know, I'm a leader of a business, I give a, I give a direction, I make decisions and so forth. And you can't satisfy everybody. But I often say to, to people that are not close to working with me farther or deeper in the organization, toss all the rocks you want. But as long as there's your name on there, 
and a suggestion of how you're going to help fix it, mm. just tossing rocks is not helpful. So that, that environment, creating an environment where people are engaged. And, and I think leaders, if we can find a way to get people to help us identify and solve the problems, not just complain about the problems, that's a real key to success. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So often some of the greatest pain can happen in an organization when there's all that kind of behind the scenes, bickering, complaining, arguing, whatever, spreading rumors, and it never gets talked about in a healthy way. So I like how, how you've talked through that. That's, that's fantastic. Hi, right, thanks for watching part one of that interview with Paul Subri. I hope you really got some good value out of it. Just want to invite you, if you are looking to invest in your own leadership development or the leadership of your team, reach out, let me know. I'd be happy to have a conversation with you, see where that goes. Stay tuned for part two. It's going to be coming out soon, and you can learn some more from this great leader, Paul Subri.